Hello and welcome to the second section of this first volume, Designing and Deploying VMware Horizon 7. So what are you going to learn in this section? In this section we're going to concentrate on the design aspects of your Horizon 7 environment. We'll start with an overview of how you should approach the project and the steps and processes you need to work through from building out your initial business case to proving the technology and then finally deploying your production environment. Once you've fully understood the project and identified the key drivers, the next step is to take a look at your current environment. As this is one of the most critical tasks for a successful outcome, we're going to look into this a little bit deeper and look at the industry-leading Liquidware Lab Stratosphere product for building and collecting our assessment data. Once armed with the data from the current environment and the project outline, we can now move into the design phase and look at how to build the solution, working with the VMware Horizon View pod and block architecture as our design blueprint. We'll also look at how to add DR and scalability into the solution with the cloud pod architecture. So let's get started. So let's get started with the first video of this section. In this first video, we're going to introduce you to a project methodology that is the foundation and blueprint to any VDI project. We will start at a high level and cover the three project phases to a successful deployment before then taking a deeper look into the first phase. To understand the project process, we're going to break it down into three key phases. Let's have a look at those phases in a bit more detail. The first phase is project definition. In this phase we are going to look at the business elements of the project, identifying both business and use cases. We'll also conduct an assessment to understand the current environment both from a user's perspective and also from an infrastructure overview perspective. The second phase is all about proving the chosen technology and that it delivers against all your requirements. It gives you the opportunity to test the solution in your own environment. The final phase is all about taking the information in the first two phases, along with the assessment data, and then designing an environment that suits your requirements. Don't forget to make sure that you refer back to your project definition and success criteria as you work through the deployment to ensure you remain on track with the original goals. So now let's begin to dive a little deeper into the project phases, starting with phase one, the project definition and what that actually means. We'll start with identifying the business drivers. Before you jump headlong into your Horizon project, take a step back and ensure that you document exactly what you are trying to achieve. More often than not, it can be very easy to get carried away with all the new shiny technological aspects of the solution, such as the installation and configuration of new hardware and software, that the end goal is either lost or is not relevant to the business anymore. It may be an obvious point to make, but the key to identifying the business drivers is to really understand what you want to evaluate. By this we mean, is it a strategic decision based on the need to transform your organisation with new working initiatives, or is there a more compelling event, such as the end of life of an operating system or application? It may even simply be the need to reduce costs. Whatever the case, you need to get that nailed down, written up and documented on day one, so the project has meaning and direction, and even more importantly, provide a baseline to refer back to when it comes to review time, to gauge whether or not the project has been successful. Start by writing a document of requirements that lists the business needs, the current problems you need to solve, the vision, and any compromises and assumptions. As you progress through your project, you should regularly refer back to this document to keep yourself focused on the end goal. Building the business case. Next, we're going to look at how to build the business case. Once you have defined the drivers behind an initiative or the compelling event that's kicked off the project and understood the high level objectives, the next stage is to start building the business case around these. This requires you to go to the next level of detail and to start drilling into the specific areas the solution needs to address. To do this, you need firstly to understand the business strategy and then identify the key stakeholders for the project. You can then start to define the high-level requirements of each of the areas identified as drivers and also start to define user segmentation. For example, you can look at what different user types you have, how they work today and what they need going forward. At the end of the day, it will be the end users that decide whether or not the project is a success, not you. This leads us into the next section, the assessment phase. Once you've built your business case and validated it against your strategy and identified that there is a requirement for a new way of delivering a desktop environment, then the next stage is to run an assessment. So what do we mean by an assessment and what actually is involved? It comes down to several things that we are looking for. This includes examining your current desktop landscape by means of some form of desktop assessment so you can understand what is currently being delivered, to whom it's being delivered and more importantly how resource intensive it is. 
The assessment is designed to build up a picture of what the current environment actually looks like. Some of the key metrics we're looking for include things like which users are using which applications and application usage, resource consumption, whether that be CPU, memory, disk or network. These are all the key things we're looking for. Login times. Applications that are unsuitable for VDI. Which client operating systems are being used. And what current delivery methods do you have in place? RDSH, ZenApp, existing VDI, physical PCs and so on. What you're ultimately looking to achieve is to create a baseline of what your environment looks like today. Then, as you move into defining the success criteria and proving the technology, you have a baseline as a reference point to demonstrate how you have improved current functionality and delivered on the business case and strategy. There are a number of different third-party products on the market that you can use to conduct a desktop assessment, and you are often able to use the services of a partner to assist with the process to help you understand the information from the assessment. In this course we're going to have a look at one of the most popular and comprehensive solutions available for assessments, and that's Liquidware Lab's Stratosphere solution, and we'll take a look at that shortly. As well as the actual collecting of the assessment data, there are a number of other points that you should take into consideration and look at. This will help you understand what some of the raw assessment data is actually telling you. For example, it might tell you that a particular user is unsuitable to have a virtual desktop due to the amount of resources they consume. However, when you speak to them, you may well find that whatever they're doing isn't going to be relevant once you move into VDI. So what do you actually do? While working in an IT department, you often have a good level of understanding of the tasks that users undertake and the software that you use to achieve these tasks on a daily basis. However, this can usually be a lot more complex than it may first appear. By understand, understanding a desktop assessment, you gather a granular level of understanding about the processes, applications and experience your users are getting from their existing desktops. This will likely include the applications they use and those that they don't use, including the installed versions and capacity and performance requirements, as well as user experience metrics such as login times and application load times. Understanding the applications in use is going to be a key element moving forward. This will have an impact in many areas, including the number of pools, pool design, application virtualization, and, potentially, whether the desktop that gets assigned to the user can be non-persistent or they will need to be allocated a persistent desktop. With the metrics gathered from the assessment, you will be able to fully understand the current situation of your desktop estate. It's not uncommon to find many disparate versions of software, meaning potential security risks, and in other cases, key applications actually crashing on a regular basis. This information will help you build a business case for change and to help you prioritise your rollout to the users with the biggest security holes or the worst user experience. If you don't undertake a desktop assessment, it is likely that your desktops might be sized in one of two ways. The first would be by sizing your desktops based on the manufacturer's minimum recommendations and you will size based on the specifications of a physical desktop PC, which will potentially be the most cost effective but is likely to cause you the most amount of problems. The flip-flop side would be to base your desktops on the software manufacturer's recommended specifications. While your users might end up happy with this solution, it is likely that this is going to cost you the most and potentially mean that you will fail to get a sign-off for your project. By undertaking the desktop assessment, you can actually understand what the performance curves look like throughout the working day. You're likely to see many dips and spikes throughout the day such as login storms, antivirus scans, log-off storms and other metrics such as increased internet usage during lunch breaks. If you work in an education environment, you might see many login and log-off storms throughout the day. It is important to understand this, as you will need to ensure your solution is designed to meet these requirements. This information can be used to help guide you when you're sizing the relevant desktop pools, but bear in mind that potentially you are going to be making changes to the desktops between the assessment phase and deploying VDI desktops. This may be something such as migrating from Windows 7 to Windows 10, or moving to a desktop that has been heavily optimised in comparison to an OEM installation of Windows. The assessment will have been performed on the previous version of the operating system and therefore may not give you 100% accurate information on the resources required. Above all else, what matters is the user experience, which is the measurement of how good or how poor the user's experience of using their desktop actually is. When you undertake a server virtualization project, if done correctly, the users will probably not even realize it has happened. With a desktop virtualization or any other EUC type project, it is more likely that they will realize a change has happened and you need to ensure that this is a positive experience for the project to be a success. The measurements of user experience will be wide and varied, but these will include elements such as boot time, 
application load time, login time, page load time, and application failures. As you are progressing through the proof of concept, pilot, and tuning processes, you need to ensure that the user experience is constantly improving. Failing to take user experience into consideration will result in a definite failure of the project. While the desktop assessment process is an important part of any EUC project, it should not replace the need to interact with your end users. The benefit of human involvement is that you are able to pick up elements that simply would not be possible with software alone. Start by simply walking through your office, noting what the users are doing, what applications they're using, any accessories they have, how many screens, and whether or not they're using laptops or PCs, and so on. Once you have this high level of understanding, consider booking meetings with key business leaders in each department to understand their needs, requirements, and the problems they have with their desktops today. You should also start considering who your department champions are going to be. So what are department champions? If you're going to make a short list of takeaway considerations from this course, department champions should be high on your list. A department champion is a user who is going to be the go-to person within the department for everything to do with their department's desktop design, testing and support. They don't need to be IT experts, but should have a desire to help you improve their overall desktop experience. You will work with these champions to help you with the design of their desktops as they will be your first port of call for testing and then testing again after you have listened to and implemented any of the given feedback. By working with a department champion, you will have a sponsor within the department. They will have a sense of pride and ownership over what is being rolled out and will be there to help you sculpt the desktop and be the user on your side to help explain why certain decisions have been made. Finally, we have the, the success criteria. The key objective in defining the success criteria is to document what a good solution should look like for the project to succeed and become production ready. You need to clearly define the elements that need to function correctly in order to move from proof of concept to proof of technology and then into a pilot phase before finally deploying into production. You need to fully document what these elements are and get the end users or other project stakeholders to sign up to them. It's almost like creating a statement of work with a clearly defined list of tasks. One important factor is to ensure that during the phase of the project, the criteria don't start to grow beyond the original scope. That means that any other additional elements should not get added to the success criteria, or at least not without discussing it first. It may well transpire that something key was missed. However, if you have conducted your assessment thoroughly, this should not happen. Another thing that works well at this stage is to again involve the end users. Set up a steering committee or advisory panel by selecting people from different departments to act as sponsors within their area of the business. Actively involve them in the testing phases, but get them on board early to get their input in shaping the solution from the outset. Too many projects fail when an end user tries something that didn't work. However, the thing that they tried is not actually a relevant use case or as something that is used by the business as a critical line of business application, and therefore shouldn't derail the project. I once saw a VDI project fail due to the unresponsiveness of a mouse in Microsoft Paint, which knocked the project way off course while the issue was investigated. The upshot was that Paint was not actually used by anyone, and so was totally irrelevant to the business or use case, but it still burned precious cycles while trying to enhance the performance of the mouse within Paint. If we have a set of success criteria defined up front that the end users have signed up to, anything outside that criteria is not in scope. If it's not defined in the document, it should be disregarded and not being part of what success should look like. 